Hi, and welcome to the X-22 Report Spotlight. Today's guest is David Morgan. David is a precious metals aficionado armed with degrees in finance and economics, as well as engineering. David has appeared on CNBC, Fox Business, and others. He's the creator and owner of the Morgan Report newsletter. You can also see his work on themorganreport.com. You can also check him out on his YouTube channel, The Morgan Report. And I am very happy to have him back on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Dave, welcome back to the Spotlight. Well, thank you so much. It's great to be here. Hey, thanks for being on the Spotlight once again. And we have a new president right now, um, Donald Trump. Um, it looks like he beat out Hillary Clinton. I am sure a lot of people are shocked. Other people are saying that, you know, I knew this was going to happen. And uh, I just wanted to get your thoughts on with this new president, where do you think the economy is headed still? Do you think we're still on track for major problems? Where do you think silver and gold are going to go right now? Where do you think everything is headed? Oh, well, great question. And it's, you know, opinion at this point. But uh, first of all, a lot of uh, what goes on at the level of the president is rhetoric. It's talk. It's, you know, the power that's in that office is probably perceived to be greater than the ability of the office to really make a substantial change. And what I mean by that is that the president really has little to do with the economy. Although, you know, all of these candidates will tell you that I'm going to make the economy better. I'm going to pay down the deficit. I, 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 I. Well, first of all, the way it's set up is three branches of government <clears throat> that are checks and balances on each other. That's the way it was initially intended. So the point I'm making is that I, as I've said uh, on other interviews, I was asked several times, especially in Canada, you know, what are your thoughts on the election? And being uh, pretty agnostic toward the political scene, I said that it's like changing the captain on the Titanic. I think we've already hit the iceberg, and regardless of who's at the helm, the ship's going down. I'm not predicting like total, complete zombie apocalypse, although I am seen, as you asked me, you know, with, with someone new at the helm, will it get better or not? I think it could. A lot of things in life happen to be outside of uh, the physical plane, which means that a lot of it has to do with your attitude. I mean, a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, that immeasurable part of a, called the human spirit. Uh, if there's enough people that are, let's say, of a better attitude toward what they do or what they want to do or their actions. But it all comes down to actions, not words. So I'm watching carefully to see if the follow through is walk the walk and not just talk the talk and how much pushback and uh Finessing is required to get, let's say, the country back on track, which really means, you know, both the Senate and the House to go back to what, you know, the principles are that work. In other words, you know, the idea of a republic is self-government, self-governing, small government. That's the republic idea, republican idea, R small R, not capital R, the party. So uh, I'm somewhat optimistic. Uh I think that, um, you know, a good leader means a lot. And uh, again, the actions are important, but to, uh, words resonate with people. I mean, that's why a lot of these uh, motivational types uh, are so highly paid. They're somewhat entertainment that they, you know, get done with a one day, two day, three day uh, conference. And these people feel empowered. They feel different. They've changed their, their cellular structure momentarily, perhaps. And, to have someone that can instill that, and I'm not saying Trump can, that remains to be determined. And to draw this very, very wide chasm that's been completely uh, enlarged over and over between the two basic camps of people that feel a certain way about what the government's function is, to narrow that and bring people together is a huge challenge. And I think it could be accomplished, this is my opinion, based on the fundamental principles on which this country started and to reinforce those through rhetoric and action and to tell the people at large, you know, that they have a lot of freedom and what that means and what the responsibilities are for having that freedom. 
and that to have everything handed to you is the exact opposite of freedom, although it's security. So as Franklin said, you know, if you're going to give up uh, freedom for security, you'll end up with neither. And everything that we've been looking at going all the way back to 2008, uh, we see the economy deteriorating quite a bit. I mean, when you look at many of the indicators, we have a huge amount of debt, not just here in the United States, but around the world. The central bank is still in in power. We still have the shadow government. Uh, We still have problems in the Middle East. We still have uh, problems with Russia. Of course, that's coming from the corporate media and from the executive branch um, of the United States. But when we look at the economy and we see how much trouble we're in right now, where the corporate default, they're rising, where we see delinquencies on auto loans, student loans, they're rising, where we see a lot of the indicators like the Dallas Fed, the New York Fed, the Fed Labor uh, Index, all signaling a recession. How could Trump pull us out of this? I mean, do you see this as a possibility or as a businessman, do you think he'll say, just like he does with his other businesses, listen, just like my other business, it's not doing well. We have to declare bankruptcy. Well, with the country, we need to reset here. And there's no other way we can get around this. We need to get rid of the debt. We need to change things. Do, do you think he's going to head in that type of direction? Yes, yeah, well said. I just want to uh, strengthen what you already said. You did an excellent job. I mean, I just gave a speech at the uh, Minds and Money Conference in Toronto about a month ago. And uh, I had a little extra time and I went through and said, and I'm going to kind of repeat what you said. I'll just say it in a different way that regardless of the ideology, if it's communism, fascism, socialism, a democracy, a republic, a monarchy, it really doesn't matter if you realize that above that ideology stands the banking system. You know, you never hear about the communists saying that they still use the Keynesian economic model or the same thing with the Chinese or whatever. In fact, that was the reason that the Chinese economic miracle slash boom happened. And it just drilled down into a personal story. When I was in Beijing uh, many, many years ago, it was rumored, I don't know, I didn't see him, but uh, word spreads pretty fast that uh, the Rockefeller contingency was in that same hotel. All I'm saying is that the bankers rule whatever ideology is. Uh, Mira Rothschilds purportedly said, you know, I care not who makes the laws as long as I, you know, make the money. That's a paraphrase. But that's the idea. So that's what you were saying. So does it make a big difference? And could Trump get up and say, you know, we're bankrupt and we need a reset? You know, I like that idea of telling the truth to the public at large as long as um, you do it, you know, I mean, you can't get out of it. I mean, the truth is the truth. You can't escape it. You can deny it. You can overlook it. You can pretend the gorilla isn't in the room. You can do all those things, and it doesn't help anything. I do like the idea of it. Could he do it? Yes, he could. Would he do it? I don't know. And the problem with doing it is uh, how do you do it in a manner that uh, you get the people to accept it? Uh, Because hard times are coming regardless of who's in the presidency, who is at the Federal Reserve. Um, As long as this system is destined to failure, and it is, it's mathematically impossible to pay back the debt, not only the U.S., but almost every other major country. Everything depends on the energy equation, which means oil largely still today. And the moral uh, attitude of the people in any nation state is one that's pretty depressed which means that they don't trust their governments, they don't trust the authority figures, they don't trust the corporatocracy, they don't trust the big powers, they know that they are getting the short end of the stick, that there isn't real justice or freedom hardly anywhere anymore. And that leads to, you know, the word I used previously, their attitude. Their attitude is one of, my goodness, you know, I don't have any power, I don't have any way out. I have little to look forward to and even less for my children and that type of thing. And again, if you go back to the Reagan era, uh, you know, Reagan kind of instilled this kind of happy, bright outlook kind of an attitude, which actually economically 
you know, helped. And there were things that were done with the Laffer curve and all this stuff. But uh, so I think one would be he would have to reset the attitude of the country at large and narrow that chasm that I talked about where people realize, hey, we're all in this country. Love of country doesn't mean love of government. Let's the government back to the fundamental principles and let's basically be teaching that at the presidential level. If he could achieve that and bring some more harmony to both sides, then after that was a foundational situation, let's say for a year, he might just say, look, the deficit has gone up under my you know, presidency and here's why, and there's little that I control. I didn't maybe realize that at the time I ran for office, but now I fully understand that it's the banking system and here's what's wrong with it. And we need to go on from here. And this is my outline. It's a three-step plan. And this is it. One, we are going to take back the issuance of the currency as stated in the constitution. There is no need for a private banking cartel to run us and we borrow from them and we have to bow down to them and they rule over us wrong. So as of right now, A happens, which is, you know, abolish the Federal Reserve. B happens, or, you know, I mean, and these are radical ideas. I'm not trying, radical for today, there were fundamental principles in the beginning, but today to go back to the foundational principles would be very, very difficult to pull off. But could it be done? I'm such an optimist and such an idealist. You know, I'm probably not the guy to have on the show, although you asked me, I'm very honored and proud to be here. But, um, you know, I'm so idealistic. I actually think it could be done, not that it would be done, and not that it would be pulled off. I mean, regardless of how it's accomplished, you're either going to have Mother Nature take care of it, and it's going to be a collapse, and it's going to be somewhat chaotic, or you can admit the problem and start and, and propose a solution Try to get most people on board for what's going to take place and see if you can rebuild with their, you know, let's say, regrounded attitude and ability of of what this country is. What made it so great is that we had the attitude that, you know, we couldn't be defeated. And it doesn't mean about war. It means about this attitude of, you know, hard work, perseverance pays off in the long run. You know, I, I agree with what you're saying. And I don't think this is such a radical idea because Andrew Jackson he ran on the platform of getting rid of the central bank, uh, and that's why they made an attempt on his life to assassinate him, but that didn't work out, and he did get rid of the central bank. And the problem I see with Trump coming out and saying all these things is that he would have to be very careful on how he does it, because if he starts saying that the economy is a lot worse than what the government has been telling you all along, we have major problems here, uh, we, the debt is unsustainable, which means if he says all of these things, the government has been lying to us throughout all these years. And if he does make the move to get rid of the central bank, and I remember Hillary Clinton getting very angry when Trump actually mentioned the central bank and the Federal Reserve, um, and she got quite angry when he was talking about that. But if he does come out and say this, it's going to show that the government has been lying to us. We never really needed the Federal Reserve. And people's worlds, they're just going to, the, the, the perception of everything that this country is about is going to completely collapse. People are going to get very angry. And he's going to have to be very careful. Now, will the central bank allow him to do this? Will the shadow government allow him to do this? I don't know. I, I think what's going to happen with Trump I think they're going to speak to him and they're going to tell him, you know, once he's in office, you know, what's really going on, what's really happening. And, you know, and I think he's maybe he'll be threatened. I don't know. But I think he's going to have a different perception of what's going on. Now, we'll have to see how he takes this. Hopefully he's strong enough to say, you know, something. I don't care what you guys say. I don't take these threats. I'm, I'm going to tell the American people what is really happening. That would be a great thing. But like you said, the central bank is there, the shadow government. We still have these same problems. And I'm hoping that he can overcome all of this. Yes, I hope so as well. And I want to, again, add on to what you said and just, again, reemphasize it. Uh, it's my strong belief. I can't prove it, but you know, I don't go into my background too much before I, you know, started the website and you know, I worked for coin dealers briefly and brokers and that type of thing. I have a financial background, as everyone knows. Prior to that, 
I worked in uh, the aircraft industry and had a pretty high level clearance. And, uh, you know, I mentioned in the latest report that was issued about a week ago about the deep state. And so, as you said, I truly believe that uh, after the um, the swearing in of the, of the office of the presidency, there's probably a sit down meeting uh, and he is told basically how it really works. And um, he's more or less at a middle management level relative to the banking system controlling basically any nation state, as I outlined a little bit ago. So I think that is reality. Now, can I prove that? No. Does it take place? I'm not certain. Uh, what I do know is that the idea of the president having you know all kinds of power is really a myth. I know a lot of people probably believe that. I think uh, that the alternative media like you, Dave, and Myself and many, many others. I mean, you could talk about, you know, Peter Schiff and uh, this Richie from Boston does a great job. I mean, Anthony Patch gets into physics that most people don't understand. I mean, there's so many out there that are really strong intellects and heartfelt people that are willing to tell the truth in the alternative media. And I think that the powers that be really dislike uh, the ability of the internet to really provide information that goes well beyond what the mainstream press can do. And it's so the, the mainstream press has become a farce. I'm off on a tangent. I don't mean to be, I just want to say again, I'll reiterate that I think that there is the power above the presidency that basically says, look, here's the boundaries that you are limited to. And as you said, if he's strong enough to say, you know what, my life is, you know, one life and I'm willing to go. And I don't want him to be a martyr. I don't want to misstate this. I don't want people, you know, sending you a bunch of hate mail or me either. But at some point, somewhere, at some time, someone or some ones have got to stand up and, and take a stance and not back down. I mean, obviously, Kennedy did it. And you see what the price that he paid in today's world. Well, uh, would that happen again? Well, just look at uh, look at the real world look at some of the bankers i mean for a while there were we seen a lot of bankers that were just you know suiciding themselves jumping out of buildings that type of thing i mean come on so we live in a very dark world at times and uh so he may be given the mandate you know go along to get along you've got to you know you can do this and do that but uh, you can't touch you know the banking system or you can't touch you know, whatever. So I don't know. It's frustrating to me because, again, I'm such an idealist, but I'm also a realist. And you can't be both at the same time in your thoughts. So when I go back to my realistic side, it's like, you know what? It may help, but it's probably not going to help that much. I wanted to talk about um, gold and silver right now. I've seen a little bit of suppression. We know that HSBC um, Nova Scotia and other banks, uh, they were brought up on charges of manipulating the silver market, precious metals market, and Deutsche Bank was part of that also. Right now, where do you think gold and silver are going to be headed? Do you think we're going to see a breakout of gold and silver, or do you think it's going to be just status quo, what we've been seeing? Uh, great question. I mean, right now, I don't have enough data for the intermediate term. We had a great run, as you know, from the beginning of 2016 up until about a month ago. We got pushed back. This commitment of traders looked horrible, although the markets were trading differently. And from the uh, maturity, which is still uh, small in years, in, in time, the SGE, the Shanghai Gold Exchange, basically – if you look at the paper paradigm, the Shanghai Gold Exchange is taking on the COMEX one for one, which means that as the commercial interest or the banks basically are shorting the metals on the way up, the counterparties are basically the Chinese or through the uh, Shanghai Gold Exchange, which is very interesting. We haven't had this until recently. So they have got uh, pretty deep pockets, it appears, because the open interest has continued to grow. However, uh, when you do probabilities, you go with the most probable thing. I mean, when you've got, you know, the best pitcher in the in Major League Baseball throwing the ball, you're going to bet that he's going to get a lot of strikeouts. It's the same thing with the commitment of traders. When it got so high, the bet was that the market would be pushed down. What I didn't have in my thinking, but I still warned my people and got them out at a partial profit basis or a hedge basis before the event was based on the commitment of traders. What I didn't know was that 
you know, it would be that one week where the Chinese basically stayed away from the market during their celebration. And that was the exact time that there was this huge sell off in the gold and silver markets. Now, was that a quid pro quo of some type where it's like, look, we're getting into the uh, the SDR. We're going to be part of the IMF's special drawing rights. And as a tip of the hat to you and as kind of a thank you note, we'll just stay away from the markets. Was that just a coincidence? No, I don't know. What I do know is the market got hammered hard and they had tried a couple of attempts before that, Dave, and nothing happened. But when they just stood and put their hands in their pockets and didn't cover their long positions, we got this huge sell-off. So basis that, I think that the markets were going to probably deteriorate. Uh, they'll go up and down, back and forth. But I think till the end of the year, we're not going to see a lot of movement. And just for the record, and this is you know something that uh, will be in our new book called Second Chance, How to Profit from the Coming you know, huge increase in the precious metals uh, that just got published. What I talk about is that the biggest part of the move is in the last part of the time. 90% of the move comes in the last 10% of the time. That's true in almost all markets, the stock market, the tech wreck, uh, the real estate market. It'll be true in the precious metals, I believe. I can't prove it. It happened last time. I think it's going to be set up. So $26 silver and 1550 gold is where if you're very, very conservative and you're not really paying much attention to the metal, I'll say, well, I need a little bit. You know, I need like 5% or 10%. Those are the levels that pretty much guarantee that the bull market's really going to start to accelerate. And we're pretty far away from those numbers right now. So by the end of the year, we've seen the metal sell off every year for the last four years into the last trading day being the last tick of the lowest price. Does that mean it's going to happen again this year? And the answer is no. However, the probability is still there. So I think we're going to have somewhat of a weak market um, till the end of the year. It won't be. We're still in a bull market. The bull started again. It's nothing to panic. Well, David Morgan doesn't like the metals anymore. Not true. I'm more bullish than ever. But you ask me on an intermediate term basis, the answer is I don't know. But I favor it being weaker than most people. And I think we'll rebuild. We're going to get more interest in the metals as the economy continues to deteriorate. More people wake up and say, you know, I'm responsible for my finances. It isn't my banker. It isn't my broker. It isn't my parents. And it's not the government. It's me. And the more people that take that kind of attitude will start coming into the precious metals in physical form. And the more that happens, the less the banks have control of it. You mentioned the uh, SDR, and I just interviewed uh, James Rickards, and I know he's been on a lot of other um, alternative media channels talking about the SDR replacing the dollar. And when this happens, he says the dollar is going to be devalued. What effect does, will this have on gold and silver if the dollar is devalued, the SDR is a replacement for the reserve dollar, and it becomes the global currency? What do you think happens to gold and silver at that point? Absolutely. They'll go up. And that's kind of those metrics I just gave you uh, as that takes place or if it takes place. And I certainly don't uh, discount it. I think it's a, a pretty strong possibility. Then the paper price will be higher. So you'll see, um, you know, the, the idea of gold and silver, especially gold, is that you maintain your purchasing power. You just don't lose all, every, all your neighbors are losing, you know, the ability of, what their pension will buy them or what their social security check will buy them or what their annuity buys them or what their stocks are worth or their dividend payments or any of that paper paradigm. Uh, if you hold gold and silver, especially, you know, gold actually is more a constant. And of course, silver is a constant as well. But the idea is that the dollar is going down, that gold, gold doesn't change an ounce of gold to an ounce of gold. Its purchasing power changes relative to what the currency is doing. So just to reiterate, it does mean that you need it and it will be important. And I look at that, Dave, in the 2017 time frame, and then I think we're going to get the big acceleration, this huge move that I expect in the precious metals, probably into the 2018 time frame. Uh, that's what I'm looking for. I think we're going to see like probably a six month, could be a year long run up in the metals. It will accelerate. It will go parabolic. It will be on the mainstream news. And, um, it's going to be tough to tell people to get out of it. And that's why I wrote this book with uh, David Smith, because I'm not suggesting that you turn your metal into paper. 
what I am suggesting is you think about how it is overvalued relative to what it purchases and have a, an exit plan. And we have several chapters on different ways to do that. And I put caveats in the book. You know, I don't want to be on record after spending my life about, you know, learning and teaching about honest money to all of a sudden say, hey, take this honest money and turn it into a bunch of paper. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that you got to think it through. And even the metals can get overvalued and be prepared for that mentally when they are overvalued. I look at it in several ways. I don't want to preach about it. But, you know, there's something that to be said about um, the responsibility that comes with that kind of, let's say, uh, paradigm. If you shift your paradigm from being just an average person uh, and you're able to um, maintain your uh, purchasing power and others around you are not, uh, you know, it's up to your own conscience. I know where mine's at. So there may be a, an opportunity to be of service to others. This is the kind of attitude I think that I was talking about earlier, that the attitude of the 80s is like, oh, my goodness, I'm rich now. And I cashed out my gold position at $800 an ounce and, you know, buying the second house and the fast cars and the, you know, vacation home and all that. Those days are gone. I think this time around it's going to be more about what you can give rather than what you can get for yourself. So when you talk about uh, gold being overvalued, are you talking about when we make the move into uh, the SDR and the dollar is devalued and the price of gold goes up, there will become a point where it becomes overvalued? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, it is. I'm sorry I wasn't clear, but thanks for – so let's okay. the, use the overused uh, – it's just so overused, but it's true. And everyone knows it, uh, even people that aren't, you know, gold bugs. But, you know, an ounce of gold by a fine man, man suit in the Roman Empire. You could buy a toga with sandals and, you know, all that. Okay. And you could buy a fine man suit in the 1800s, 1900s, and today. Okay. So if that ounce of gold buys the men's warehouse clothing store, okay, now you're saying it, it's, it's got to be overvalued. If this constant gold coin buys a fine man's suit all through history, and now it'll buy the men's warehouse or two men's clothing stores. I would suggest for your consideration, it's highly overvalued. So what do you do with it now? Well, do you buy a bunch of suits? No, you probably buy the business. And so that's what I'm saying is it will get overvalued in real terms. And when you see that, I'll be helping my people and others, you know, get out of their positions and move into something that makes sense for them. And that's an individual choice. It could be land, it could be real estate, it could be a business, it could be helping others, it could be starting a farming community, it could be organic gardening. I don't know. I mean, I'm not telling anyone what to do. I'm too free market for that. What I'm suggesting is there will come a time where you've really got to look at it objectively and not make it your religion. I mean, you don't want to be holding a bunch of gold when it's that overvalued, only to see it come back down and go back to where you started from. And the reason that it becomes overvalued, is that because of everything resetting? Yes. Or Yes. Okay. So we're, yes. we're going to be going through a period of time where everything is being devalued. The economy is getting worse. Gold is going to be moving up. And then as things start to level off and we have this reset and, and everything starts to, I guess I'll use the word, go back to normal. That's when it's time to start thinking about getting rid of your gold position. Right. And it's a reset of two things in a way. It's a reset of consciousness and a reset of the monetary system. Because let's take an example of someone that owns that uh, clothing store. Or a, a hotel is one that was used in, in a real life example, not a fiction theoretical thing in the uh, Weimar Republic. And so there are businessmen out there that believe in the paper paradigm and know nothing about monetary history. And now they're waking up to the cold, hard fact that's right in front of them. And they realize they need to have some precious metal. So they're willing to sell uh, part of their business or take on a partner or whatever, just to salvage what they have left in the physical plane, you know, in that clothing store or that uh, department store or whatever, and take on the gold to save, you know, their, their business or themselves or their families or whatever. And so they start to rethink the whole monetary system at the same time that they're striving to, you know, maintain some means to make a living. 
I mean, it sounds rather harsh, but this does take place. These are very, very, very rare events. I mean, you know, my friend Mike Maloney talks about a currency reset about every 40 years. I don't dispute that. But in some of those, it's just basically the, the money, you know, pictures on it changes. They go from little pictures to bigger pictures and that type of thing. The type that we're talking about, a major reset where you have a financial debacle that affects almost everybody on the planet. Those are rare. How long, uh, just maybe, maybe you said it, maybe I didn't hear it. How long do you think this will be where we have this overvalue of gold? Like how long will it take? Will it like... Will it be like I don't know. I've been wrong. I thought, you know, we would see it by, you know, 2015 or so. Uh, but I really think it'll be before Trump leaves office. I think it'll be within the next four years. I really don't think it's going to go five. I think it's going to be somewhere in the 2018 to 2020, 2020 time frame. I really believe that there's, you know, it's too easy uh a math model. I mean, an exponential function only can go for so long. And we've been in this hockey stick, this straight up debt mode for a long time now, and nothing goes to the sky. They can print, they can push, they can rain helicopter money, they can do a lot of things, but it doesn't stop the truth. And you can't print wealth and the wealth is deteriorating because as an Austrian economist, real wealth is the means of production. You've got to produce things. I mean, there was a quote that's going around the internet right now that the government workforce is, I don't know, 20 million government worker bees and you've only got 10 million in the manufacturing sector. That tells you right there that we're producing less and, and mandating more, more laws, more restrictions, more, you know, uh, suffocations on our freedom, our free speech, all this stuff. And then you look over at China and I'm not a huge China advocate, but they've produced a lot more uh, real stuff. Uh, you can take your criticism of it. In fact, I'm going to dwell there a little bit, Dave, if you don't mind. But, you know, I'm old enough to okay. remember that when you know, Japan was the big industrial power moving to the means of production. I mean, everything that came from Japan was a joke. I mean, oh, made in Japan, ha, 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 ha. You know, I'm old enough to know that. But then as the years went by, it became coveted that, you know, Japanese camera, Japanese stereo, Japanese car, everything that they made was becoming the best. And I see China could possibly do that function. Of course, with this disarray in the financial markets, it's kind of, it's harder to predict because there's so much mistrust. I mean, the whole thing is based on the confidence and confidence comes from, you know, con comes from confidence. It's a con game. And the con game is being seen through more and more every day. And so there will be something that takes place. Again, I think it's going to be shorter than this next four years. We, we've been mentioning the SDR and uh, the devaluation of the currency, but nothing's really changed if we move to the SDR as a global currency, we're, we're still under the central bank umbrella. Exactly. And Rick, Rickards does a good job in his, uh, the new case for gold. I mean, I, I've misquoted him, but I think I get the idea right. He basically says it's something that could take place, but there could be a backlash. Those are my words because people understand it's just another scheme. But if they're too ignorant to understand that, and you know, it's sold correctly, they do a great sales job internationally about this is going to, this is our way out. This is going to integrate all the currencies. It'll level the markets. It'll be more fair. And you know, they had a good sales job. It'll probably, it could be implemented. Well, I guess they did it with uh, coming off the gold standard in 1971, uh, where they said it was because of speculators. This is going to be temporary. And then we started really a, a completely new currency system and people just went with it. But today it might be a little bit different because we do have the Internet. People have been speaking out um, and more people know about the central bank and what they're up to and what they control. So it might be a little bit different this time, hopefully. Yeah, I agree. Hopefully. I mean, it's, you know, it's incumbent on we the people. I mean, really. The way it's supposed to work is that, you know, our our wishes, you know, we're self-governing, supposedly. And we say, no, you know, we don't want that, you know, and you let it be known by your representative that's supposed to represent you and say, no, we don't want this. We don't want another banking system on top of one that already doesn't work. Why would we want that? We've had something that hasn't worked for a very long time. Now we're going to add something that's almost identical to it. 
that's also not going to work. We don't want it. We, you know, that type of thing. And as you said, with the internet, you know, there will be more of a backlash than let's say uh, there could be in the you know 1970s or whatever. So it remains to be determined. Uh, Rickards is again pretty clear in his book. He doesn't say it's going to happen. I think he, you know, I, I think he's got a good. I think he's a great thinker. I like his, you know, the way he looks at the um, economic system. Uh, he uses theories that are true uh, math-wise. Uh, they're outside of the normal way of thinking about it, and he, he structures it in a way that's easily understood by almost everybody. Uh, but, you know, part of what he's saying, and I'm not saying that this is necessarily true, but he looks deep enough to see the way the bankers think. And, you know, I've ta I have used to talk to Eric King on a pretty regular basis, and I told Eric early on in our conversations, look, the only way to really think this through correctly, in my opinion, is to think like a criminal. I mean, if you start thinking like a criminal, you'll get a much better understanding of how these people think. I agree with that. I mean, you have to put yourself in their position and understand what they're trying to do here. And, you know, and then you can figure out what's going to happen i mean i mean not like you have a crystal ball and you can see it but you can see the different indicators and you can see what they're trying to do i mean their plans don't always work uh they get messed up but you can see what they're trying to do dave um i really appreciate you coming on the x22 report spotlight thank you very much once again how can people see your work Let's go to themorganreport.com and get our free report, Riches and Resources. There's two free movies there. One's on the end of the Age of Empire, which is where we are right now on a global basis. And the other movie is The Empty ATM, which shows you a documentary of the currency crisis in Argentina in 2000, 2001, which will give you a good idea of what we may be facing in this country over the next four years, as we outlined during this interview. Dave, once again, thanks for thank you for being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Totally my pleasure. Thank you.